This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Isotope, Sonarworks, and API. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Spectra 1964 STX100 mic pre in an API lunchbox mixed carefully through Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. I saw George Benson when I was 21, 22, and I sat in the front row at a little club, and for the first half hour, I was, I was depressed, thinking, you know, I will never be able to play like that. And then suddenly, something flipped in my head, and I went, you know what? It is possible for a human being to play like that. I may not play, I may not play that like that, but I will play something like that. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. The Spectra 1964 C610 comp limiter brings fast, clean, quiet compression and limiting to your recordings and mixes. The C610 includes the famous Spectra 101 amplifier used in legendary studios like Stax, Arden, and Record Plant. I love using my C610s for drums, vocals, guitars, and especially bass, which now sounds bigger than anything I've ever recorded before. Make your mixes rock at spectra1964.com. In my studio, I've got the Mac Mini M1 paired up with the OWC Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt 4 Certified Storage and Hub Expansion Solution to connect to all my dedicated audio drives, sample libraries, and backup drives. It's the perfect size to stack with the Mac Mini and add storage and connectivity over Thunderbolt or USB. Whether you have the new or older Mac Mini, nothing stacks up in your studio quite like OWC. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Eric Bazilian, an original member of the Hooters, producer and a musician writing and recording with other artists like Cindy Lauper, Joan Osborne, The Scorpions, Ricky Martin, Jonathan Brook, Leanne Rimes, and William Whitman, to name just a few. Eric has been a guest on the podcast before on episode 122 to talk about his start in music and writing the song One of Us for Joan Osborne on his kitchen table. So please go check out that episode and hear some of the great stories he shared. Also, make sure to catch his video series, Under the Hood, um, as well as other great video content that he's creating on his YouTube channel, and we will have links to that in the show notes, so just scroll down, as well as a wonderful playlist of many of the records that he's working on. Um, And I'm going to get to more about that in just a second. I wanted to say that I received an email from Eric a little while ago, and Eric, if it's all right with you, I will just actually read what you said, because it was pretty cool. Go right ahead. Eric said, um, you know, essentially I'm doing well. um, And what's going on is um, one of the things that was going on was being stuck in Stockholm with limited resources, a 2012 MacBook Pro, an Apollo Twin, one Gefell mic, and a couple of electric guitars, a mandala, a keyboard controller, and a short-scale Gretsch bass that his son bought when he was 12, which afforded Eric the time and motivation to make his first solo album in almost 20 years. The drums were cut by his drummer in Philadelphia, um, challenging considering that there wasn't uh, a ton of engineering experience, but he was able to make it work at his studio, back at Eric's studio, and also by his other drummer in Slovenia, recorded by a producer and engineer genius in an amazing studio, contrast. Um, Eric mixed it himself on a pair of Yamaha HS5s with a lot of input from some legendary mixers, including our pal John Fields, who's been on the podcast before too. Mastered by the guy in Slovenia. I wonder if that was Eric, the same guy who was cutting the 
the recordings. One and the same. All right, cool. And then you said, you closed it out saying a real quarantine pandemic musical fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, excited to talk about that record because it's fantastic and it's called, uh, titled Bazillion. Straight to the point. Um, yeah. And also want to give a shout out to our friend, John Fields, for making our original introduction and having Eric back on the podcast. Please welcome Eric Bazillion to Recording Studio Rockstars. Once again, Eric, are you ready to rock, dude? I'm always ready to rock. Man, dude. it's great to have you back on the show. First off, are you joining us from Stockholm now? I'm actually joining you from Pennsylvania. I came back oh, home nice. yesterday. All right, cool. Um, well, I was wondering, I was thinking we're doing a late in the afternoon interview, so it would have been pretty dang late over in Stockholm right about now. Yeah. Um, well, dude, welcome back to the show. Uh, I don't know if you want to give us like kind of a, a brief update on, you know, what's what's new with you since the last time we did the episode, which I think goes back to like 2018. So I don't know how brief you want to make it. Well, um, it's it was pretty much business as usual since then. You know, I did some touring with the Hooters. Um, Rob and I, Rob Hyman, my partner in the band, uh, partner in crime, keyboard player, co-writer, singer. We did a very interesting tour in Germany in December of 2019. It's called Night of the Proms. It's been going on for, I think, 20 years. And basically it's a, a multi-artist show where, where one or two members of a band will represent that artist. And they have an orchestra and a choir and a backing band. And you tour arenas for a month and get treated like rock and roll royalty. Wow. And this is in Germany? This is in Germany. Yeah. So cool. we did it with the Alan Parsons Project. And uh, Al McKay's uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire experience. Al was the original guitarist, and he has some some uh, non-original Earth, Wind, and Fire singers who totally nail it. Wow! Uh, and so uh, Alan Parsons was there. He was there, yeah, and he was he answered all my questions. No, he does not like to compress anything except acoustic guitar solos and sometimes vocals. Nice. Well, on a side, on an Alan Parsons side note. I remember seeing a quote of him being a, a big fan of mic tech microphones, and that's what I'm using to talk to you in right now mm. on, this, on this interview. Nice. Um, speaking of which, your voice sounds great. I know that that uh, you you worked hard to get it to sound really good, and this may segue into your recording setup. So tell us what you're talking to us through. Right now I'm using the actually the same Gefell MT-71 that I recorded uh all the vocals and acoustic stuff on my Bazillion album with uh, into a, an Apollo solo. I got this fairly recently because I left my twin in Stockholm so my son could use it for his his uh, his work. He's been releasing a song a day since June twenty first, and he oh wow he's he's at one hundred and fifty now. He's got two hundred and fifty total. All right, so hold on, pause, stop the train. Yeah. Um, where do we go as rock stars, you know, to go listen to his stuff and check it out? Is he posting on social media or somewhere like that? He is not on social media. He doesn't even have a smartphone. We we had to beg him to get a cell phone. He's posting on on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Tidal, all those. And you can just search for Simon Bazillion. Okay, groovy. Awesome. That'll be super cool to check out. Um, I love hearing about people doing you know, the song a day challenge. I think that's so beneficial, you know, whatever you're working on, if you can do it regularly, it's just, it really helps. His discipline is amazing. He he actually wrote all of the songs before during a, a two year period. And now he's basically producing them. You know, they were very, some of them are very rough demos and he's keeping whatever elements he can. And some of them he's radically reinvented and some of them are true to the original demos. And, and they're all, none of them are real productions. They're all him in a laptop and I'm not allowed to give any input. Okay. <laughs> that sounds about right. I, my daughter's very musical and, and I'm not allowed to give very much input either. Um, well, cool, man. So uh, now you recently put out a fantastic record, Bazillion, um, which we should talk about. But um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your, we always sort of like to ask, you know, tell us about your studio and I guess you, maybe you're not surrounded by your studio at the moment, but, uh, or maybe you are. I'm actually looking out the kitchen window at my studio. Um, I just got home yesterday and I kind of like sitting here at the kitchen counter. There's no one else home except my daughter who's kind of coming and going, but um, I'm looking at my studio from here. And I think I described that in the last interview, barely 
extensively. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, but I can describe the studio I used to make, to make this record. Yes, yes, which please. Is, so, so we moved to Stockholm in July of 2017 and it was meant to be for a year. And uh, we got very lucky, found a great apartment to rent in a very cool part of town. And the only problem was I didn't have a studio. And for the first couple of months, I was sort of panicking. Uh, I would I would set up at the kitchen table with my Apollo twin and the one good mic that I brought and work in headphones. I actually bought a pair of the um, IK uh, uh, iLoud speakers, which were, you know, they oh, work. Cool. Sort of. Yeah, yeah. But um, and then w one day I was doing the laundry in the basement and I saw a door and I thought, hmm, what could lie beyond yon door? And I w went through the keys and opened it up and there was a big empty room, nice room. And I, I asked the neighbors, uh, well, what's the deal with that room? And they said, oh, we use it for our board meetings, you know, every few months. But why do you want to set up your studio there? Please, we would love someone to use the room. Nice. So, and at my some friends of mine were moving actually back to Slovenia from Stockholm. They gave me the Yamahas. Um, I had headphones. I had this mic. I had a couple of electric guitars. I always keep the mandola with me. Um, had my, as I said, my son's, you know, $120 Gretsch bass and a, a little keyboard controller. And I just started writing songs. And that's that's awesome. Um, so how much of those instruments made it onto the final record? Did did they all make it there or were they um, used for sort of sketching things out? Because I, I even noticed that some of the bass stuff was really fantastic. It was, that's all that's on the record. Okay, groovy. All right. Except except um, one track, one and a half tracks were recorded before I moved, actually. Uh, the last track on the album, Bleed Red, I did. Actually, I did that in 2018 or 19, but I did it when I was home here in my studio. So there's a caveat on that one. And uh, Heaven Ain't Gonna Save Us, I think I probably did here as well, because I, I, I wrote that the day after um, the last president was elected. Right. Okay. Right. And it was very topical too. Um, yep. And then Rockstars, there's also, uh, there should be links to Eric's YouTube channel, um, as I mentioned, and you've got a bunch of great little music videos to go along with these two. Really cool uh, sort of animation stuff that brings back Monty Python, you know, almost. Yeah, with... that was really, that was a lucky find too, because I, I got a message from, from, a friend of mine here, of an acquaintance who was telling me about his new record. He wanted me to check it out. And here's the video. And the video was this beautiful animation. So I, I asked him who did it. And he pointed me to a young woman named Haley Monson in Philadelphia. And she did all of them. Oh, right on. And so it just happened to be somebody from Philly, despite the fact that you were in Stockholm. By the way, I got to preemptively apologize for if you hear any hammering in the background, it's because the electrician... I'm bragging here, but it's the electrician is putting in a charger for me because I just got a new pair of reference monitors for listening to my mixes called a Tesla. Oh, nice. It's parked outside. So <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Apologies in advance for that. Yeah, you don't have to apologize for having a Tesla. All right. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the videos are great. Um, the sound of the record is fantastic. Uh, did you mix the record yourself? I mixed, um, I didn't mix um, the first track, the high note, uh, John Fields mixed for me. Okay, um, great. Great sounding sent, track too. I sent him the tracks and actually it was interesting because um, he did a great mix and he added some stuff. He added some some backing vocals and some keyboards and I I sent it to my, uh, to, to Martin in, in Slovenia who, who was going to master it. And he had heard my earlier mixes and he said, this mix is great, but I miss the crack of your snare. And I said, well, oh God, you know, what, how, what am I going to do? He said, just pull up, pull up John's mix, add your snare back in. And he also, he also preferred the vocal treatment that I had. So uh, John, who's, you know, incredibly professional and resourceful, mm -hmm. he, he had sent me stems, he had sent me instrumental and then, um, uh, and then uh, the vocal stem. So I, I took his instrumental stem, um, added my snare, used my original vocal, pulled his harmonies when I could from 
the vocal stem he sent me. And then I replaced a bit, what of his I needed to because it didn't work with the stems. And he was cool with it because he's awesome. Yeah. Want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing RX D-Click, D-Clip, DS, Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on this podcast episode. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Before your band hits the studio, it's smart to have all the songs and notes in one place. But setting up a shared cloud folder can be frustrating. There's always someone in the band who can't seem to log in or wants to use a different platform. Samply.app makes it easy to add collaborators to a project so that the whole band can upload new songs and make comments before the session. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music. Just upload a voice memo or song and start commenting. Sign up for your free account with two projects now now at Samply.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. Well, so so you were able to sort of re-add a snare sound yourself to the stems that yeah. he sent you? Was I, that, I was. Did you like replay a snare or was this more um, using samples and things like that? I, I just used the snare track that I had had originally. He had, he had triggered something else from my snare. I see. Okay. You know, what's funny is I, I'm pretty sure I remember being struck by that one, the high note, as having a really great drum sound, too. So you did it right. Yep. And and the drums, those drums were recorded by Martin in Slovenia. And, and Roman Rate is an amazing drummer. Okay, cool. Right on. Um, any other stories of working with John on that one? No, that, w- that was really it. You know, I, I sent him... I sent him a few of the tracks because, you know, I like to get opinions because I don't trust my own ears. I can't hear anything over 2K, basically. Right on. And, um, and he just said, hey, you know, give me a shot at it. And, and I loved what he did. You know, he, he added some of that modern stuff like, you know, backwards reverb on the vocal going into the verse. And, and um, he, he had put a little more schmutz on my vocal than, than I liked or, or Martin liked. So that's why I used my original lead vocal track. Okay, cool, man. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit because a lot of this project, you know, you're in this basement studio in Stockholm, but you're interacting with other musicians and sending stuff back and forth. So tell us a little bit about some of that experience. What what did you learn? What you what was great about using the internet to make a record and what sucked about it? Um well what sucked was not being in the room with people. Yeah. I, I you know, I love that interaction. Yeah. Um uh, recording drums with with David Wasikinen, uh, our drummer in the Hooters, was challenging in the beginning because he had just set up his studio and he had zero experience. Yeah, um, he, you know he had a lot of help. You know Phil Nicolo helped him set it up. I think Bill Whitman gave him some some advice, but he would send me drum tracks and like there was nothing on the snare track or the snare track was molted from one of the overheads. So like on back, like, so back in the eighties, there was no clear snare track. So I literally took one of the overheads and, you know, manually chopped the snares. And that's a, that's totally a trigger. And then, you know, that the drums turned out great on that track too. And I thought it was really poignant that for a song called back in the eighties, you guys just went for the big mega snare sound anyway. Yeah, yeah, actually. And, and, more credit where credits due. I had a lot of help from help from the legendary Steve Churchyard on some of these mixes, who who wasn't hands on. He he never offered to actually mix something for me, but I would send him stuff, and he would just like send me back. You know, this is what you need to do. He actually introduced me to the um, parallel drum compression thing, mm-hmm. which I'd never done because Bill Whitman doesn't do it, and Bill has you know generally been the arbiter of of all things for me. Yeah, but uh, but you know, Steve was like, you know, just go for it. You know, that eleven seventy six hit it as hard as you can. Uh, he even told me which which eleven seventy six plugin to use, and um, and yep, it worked. So which one did did you use? 
I think I ended up using the uh, the UAD blue. Okay. All right. And, cool. And he he said just slam it, you know, uh, slowest attack, uh, quickest release, and just you know adjust to taste. So this is, um, you know, to just to over explain it for anybody who might be new to this, you're taking the raw snare track and it's on its own fader, and then you're also sending it over. Um, possibly with the sound of a hammer in the background from my microphone right now, <laughs> to mm-hmm. another track that is getting uh, that is getting slammed through this blue compressor, eleven seventy six, and then you blend the two back together into the mix, right? That's right. I think he also had me send the kick. Yep, it was kick and snare. So kick and snare to the one compressor, and then that's blended back into the drums. Right, exactly. So it, it just gives you that boom thwack, boom thwack. Yeah, yeah. I I I feel like I learned that trick from Andrew Shep's, you know, in the past few years or something like that and have really loved that. Just like you know, just having a mono compressed drum sound right up the middle. Just just the kick in the snare just really does an awesome thing to the mix. Yep, it really did. And, and you know, I I I was never into parallel compression before cuz I just figured get the setting right on the compressor. Yeah. Yep. But Some, sometimes the, the tricks just seem a little too fancy for what's needed. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, hey, it works. Sounds good. I, I'll keep doing it. Um, let me ask you this question. When you were doing it, what did you feel like was the appropriate amount to use? Did, did it feel to you like you were mostly using the raw mics and just sneaking in a little of this other thing? Did you find yourself using a lot of the compressed sound and thinking, well, shit, that sounds great, so I'm just going to keep pushing it? I, you know, I would do that and then, um, listen back and go, I, I went a little too far sometimes, but you know, right. it was, it was de- definitely audible. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Let's see. What else should I ask you about? What, what, any other stories you want to share about the mix of that back, back in the eighties song or any of the other mixes that you were working on? So, so back in the eighties, actually it was an interesting, that, that whole track has an interesting history. Um, I very rarely write songs from from a title, but um, I had a uh, an audio note in my phone of me singing back in the eighties, da 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 da, yeah. and then the next the next audio note was a uh, a mandola part because um, I, I write a lot on mandola. This whole album is pretty much written on mandola. And and remind us what's the difference between a mandola and a mandolin? Well, a real mandola is a a mandola is to a mandolin as a viola is to a violin. It's just tuned down a fifth, so it's right. uh, C, G, D, A. In Sweden, what they call a mandola is an octave mandolin tuned G, D, G, D. Okay. And it's a very, it's got a really cool sound, very kind of modal, uh, not a great melodic instrument, but for coming up with chordal riffs, I just find it's a, it's a gold mine. Okay, cool. So uh, so I had, the, I had the title, and... Uh, little bit of a melody and a chord progression. So I, you know, went in the basement and when I write, I usually just find some random drum loop to write to. And I happened to have a little sample pack of um, Matt Chamberlain that I'd bought. Nice. And I, and I had this little, this cool little thing with like a cowbell per- percussion thing going on on it. So I just put that in and I wrote, I came up with a verse and sort of a pre-chorus. And uh, I think I might have had a second verse. And then I kind of gave up on it. I felt, I felt like I, I wasn't really, I, w- I wasn't seeing the fruition of, of the song. And then a few weeks later, I did a podcast with this woman who's a medium. She speaks with the spirits of the departed. Right on. And I didn't really know that's what it was because I just generally say yes. Hey, podcast, you want to talk to me? Yeah, I'm in. So you know, I get I get on with her, and it's like, yeah. So uh, who do you want me to contact? I'm like, uh, okay, well, my dad. My dad passed away in 2018. So yeah, wow. yeah. Let's talk to my dad. Okay, do you have a question for your for your dad? So my question was sounded to her like a like a trick question. I asked him, "Where's my grandmother's birth certificate?" <laughs> and why that's relevant, we don't have to go into now. But um, it actually would be would be nice if I could find it. So she said, 
Your father's shaking his head and smiling like that's a trick question. Um, but he does want to say he's very proud of you, which, well, yeah, my dad was always very proud of me. He was my biggest fan. And there's a song that you've given up on that you need to finish. Nice. And, and when you finish that, you need to make an album. And I was like, woo, okay. And and I said, you know, no, I, I don't have a song I haven't finished. I, no, he's, that's, he's wrong. You're, you're not talking to my dad. But after we got off of, a, off of the interview, I went downstairs, opened up my hard drive, and here was a song I'd started called Back in the 80s. That's groovy. And then, and then I'm guessing that this was, you know, somewhere in 2020 that you were opening that back up and finding it, right? Yeah, that was, I think, early, early pandemic. Yeah, that must have been right, right after I went back in March. Because, uh, um, particularly because of, of um, how well crafted the third verse is to me. Well, that's, that's a whole nother story. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I came up with the chorus, you know, where are they now? Why did the good times fade away? Why can't we just hold on to all the things we, we loved back in the day? And, and, and for me, you know, the song, it's not about the 80s. It's not glorifying the 80s. I don't have a love affair with the 80s. The 80s was very good to me in my band, but really I'm kind of more into the 60s and 70s, musically speaking. Right. Um, but, you know, so that's really why the second verse is about the 60s. So I sent the song to my friend James Bourne from the legendary British band Busted, uh, who's a been a frequent collaborator. We've released a bunch of stuff together and uh, he's one of those I trust. So I sent it to him and he said two things. First of all, he said for your, your pre-chorus that those were the days, my friends, you need other chord changes. And he actually recorded piano chords for me. And I, I you know what, you're right. And I didn't even have to re-record any of the instruments to do that. All I had to do was change the bass. Oh, um, interesting. And, and, and he was right. And he said, you need a third verse. And I'm like, oh, I don't have any ideas. And he just spit off something about, uh, you know, vacate the cities, head to the country, disinfect your hands and cover your mouth. And that just happened to work with my melody perfectly. And then I put it in the line. So back in the future, we're pulling our hair, which was sort of a nod to James because his biggest hit song with his band Busted is called Year 3000, which was mm. covered by the Jonas Brothers in the U.S. And his whole motivation for that and his whole motivation for his life is the film Back to the Future. Nice. <laughs> so A I classic. Was, yeah, yeah. And in a way, you know, when we work together, we are kind of like Doc and Marty because we're 30 years apart. Yeah, Back to the Future where, where uh, Chuck Berry meets Eddie Van Halen. Right, right. So, so no, it's the way that song came together, the existence of that song really uh, owes itself to a lot of otherworldly factors. Yeah, no, I thought it was great, man. I, I mean, I've just appreciated the song on a number of levels. Um, it sounds great. It's exciting. You got a great singing voice. So, you, yeah, well, that was see, so that was another thing. I, I found the key of B. Um, I have written a couple of songs in the key of B before. Actually, there's a Hooters song that would have been a massive hit if it had come out after our first album called I'm Alive, which we wrote in 2006, which is in the key of B. And I realized that's a perfect key for my voice because hmm. that, you know, that F sharp is, you know, that's a good reach for me. I sound good up there. I can kind of squeak up to the G sharp, even the A occasionally. Um, and another factor in this, I'm, I know I'm jumping around a lot, but I had just gotten a guitar from uh, a music store in Stockholm. There's this great vintage guitar store around the corner from me. And they had gotten in a 1964 Ellie sound from Italy, which was made by the Cruccinelli Accordion Company. And wow. when I got it, uh, when they got it in, it had heavy strings on it. It had like 13s on it. And they had tuned it down to C. So I realized if I tuned it up to C sharp, played a D, that's a B chord. Nice. So most of the guitars on that album are that Ellie sound, you know, played played in D, but heard in B. At one point, I was going to call the album songs in the key of B. Nice. You know, it, what it reminds me of is just how important it is to change up our instrument. You know, I mean, you talked about the mandola and it helps you write um, 
switching to a different key. How often do you, uh, you know, where you play a D chord, but it's it just feels different. Uh, but how often do you actually even just go for totally alternate tunings on a guitar and find that useful? These days, not a whole lot. Uh, for a while, I was doing a lot in Dadgad on electric guitar. I, mm-hmm. I, I was I was borrowing a 52 blacktop telly, which sounded amazing in Dadgad. But um, uh, you know, lately, I mean, since I, you know, I, I play the mandolin, I play the mandola, um, you know, sometimes it, uh, if I'm messing around or if I just can't play a particular part in a standard tuning, I'll change it. Yeah, well, it's cool. Also, another reminder is, you know, writing in the key of B and discovering it, you know, somebody who, somebody's first question might be like, well, why is that hard to discover? And my thought is because we get, we get familiar with playing the voicings on the guitar that are easy to play, you yep. know, and kind of ring and chime well with the guitar. And you go to B flat and B, and those are those are typically, unless you're going to play a full, you know, bar chord, you know, what is it, seventh fret or whatever. Right. It's going to be a little bit tougher on the fingers and stuff. Now, a B7, that's the one that sounds, that's the easiest to play open, right? <laughs> right. That's the, that's the Beatle chord. That's the chord they went across town to learn. Nice. <laughs> But, but the, you know, the thing is, you know, playing the guitar tuned down a third, I was playing a D chord and hearing a B. Yeah, yeah. You've already invested in your speakers, headphones, and the sound treatment of your studio. So you're ready to make great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world when they leave the studio. The problem is that the frequency response of your room is not allowing your speakers to tell you the whole story. Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can solve this for you by calibrating your speakers and headphones EQ and balance so that you can now make better mix choices. Start with a 21 21- day free trial at sonarworks.com. The API Select T25 is a classic two-channel FET feedback style compressor limiter with a Class A tube output stage and custom API transformer, allowing split mono or stereo mode. Built with dual triode vacuum tubes, sidechain de-essing, detent controls for accurate recall, and API's famous thrust mode, the T25 represents a new design in tube compression. Bring the legendary sound of API to your home studio with the new Select T25 at apiaudio.com. Okay, cool. So let me see. I'm, we're jumping around. So another thing I wanted to ask you about was the oh, pre- wait, I'm sorry. Well, before we leave back in sure, the 80s, sure, the, yeah. video, the video for that. So that video was not done by Haley, the, the, um, the animator. That one uh, I have a friend in Sweden who is a, a genius filmmaker. He did uh, a couple of videos for me before. There, there was one called uh, One Light that that uh, I did in 2011 that he did. And then I, James and I did a song called Happy Birthday because I was turning 60 and he was turning 30. And, and it's, it's Happy Birthday to me. And um, I sent it to the same guy, Max. Who, uh, and he had he said, I have an idea. Just let me let me let me run with it. And I showed up and it was genius. He I, I can't even describe it. But if you just look for uh, James Bourne and Eric Bazilian or Eric Bazilian and James Bourne, happy birthday. It, it's pretty amazing. Okay, so, cool. I, so I sent him back in the 80s and he said, can you come up to the country where which is where both of our in-laws live? Uh, and uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to make this back in the 80s, but it's not going to be the 80s that everybody thinks you're talking about. The 1880s, the 1780s. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, it's up in the country, you know, you know, his his in-law's family has been there since the 1500s. Wow. And his wife had like all the clothing and we had the guy with, with the horse and carriage who happened to have had his teeth knocked out by a horse two days earlier, oh, which makes for God. some great visuals in the video. That's the guy who's on the cover of the... Um... Of the video, I think the thumbnail as well. Right, and he, he got the teeth replaced the next day, so the timing was just like awesome. Wow, wow. Um, well, I didn't want to leave that song just yet. I wanted to actually uh, bring up a couple more things that I thought were cool. One mm-hmm. is the pre-chorus, and when you change the chords, you did a thing that that I've heard you talk about too, which is this 
cool way of um oh, my lights are flickering. I think it's just the lights flickering. <laughs> I thought I was yeah. losing power. Um it's a cool way of sort of you know turning the chord progression and the melody into a round almost like you're right. flipping it around and coming yep. back to the middle again, you know. And you know questions that come to mind are like, you know, I want to ask you like how how do you feel like music and puzzles go together for you because I almost see that in the way that you appreciate constructing music. It's like, and it's something I love about it. I love how music is like sometimes almost like figuring out a Rubik's cube, you know? Yeah. I think I'm better at making puzzles than I am at, at solving them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what you have any other thoughts about that? You know, the way you describe that? Cause I think there was a under the hood video maybe that you were talking about turning the phrase around like that. Yeah, I didn't do one for that song. Um, I, mm, yeah, oh, Johnny B, probably. Yes, I think that was it. Yeah, right, because that's one where I, if you can hear the guitar. So it's 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 a three chord progression that goes over four bars. So so it turns. So it's like. Yes. More cowbell. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and, that's awesome. And another, and another thing with the, the, the back in the 80s pre-chorus where I'm I am using one of my familiar tricks. I, I like writing six bar pre-choruses because four is too short and eight is too long. So that's what I did in one of us. I've always been struck by, you know, rounds of three in choruses. Yeah. So like one of us is, you know... Is great, yeah, yeah. Fourth bar, five, six. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, very cool. Well, let's see. Um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about in the back mm -hmm. in the 80s, again, that that third verse where you know you talked about reminiscing about the old times. And again, like you said, it wasn't necessarily about the 80s so much as maybe it was about just remembering what it was like, you know, to be um, growing up. And then you very cleverly brought it to current topics. But what I really liked about the way that you crafted the third verse is rather than in this, you know, in this this time and this, this um, chapter, past couple of years where it seems like the default is like taking a side on a, on an issue. Right. You, you, you cleverly, you just sort of made it about something that everybody could relate to. And I thought that was great. And I thought I sort of had a hell yeah moment, which is when I think I texted you and I was like, this, this record is off uh -huh. the hook, man. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just asking you that question about taking things like that and making them relatable to everybody instead of, um, divisive, you know? That's, you know, that's my goal. That's what I do. I'm an entertainer. Uh, you know, I want to make people feel good. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, for me back in the eighties is about appreciating the, the, the present. Yeah. You know, that's the whole thing is why can't we just hold on to all the things we love, loved back in the day, love and never let them fade away. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay, cool. Well, um, I want to jump around to some other questions, but one that I wanted to ask you about too is uh, as I was getting ready for this, and I think I went on Wikipedia or somewhere, and it and it mentioned your age, yeah. And I that. thought I was like, "What?" <laughs> and I went and looked, you know, at your photo again. I'm like, "This guy looks young, healthy. He's got more hair than I ever had." Yeah. Um, are you, are you, uh, you know, tell, tell us about how you stay young and healthy. Cause I, if I, if I recall correctly, you're 68 while we're doing this interview. I am 68. That's uh, impressive, <laughs> man. Well done, it, dude. It feels weird coming out of my mouth, but yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess I got good genes, you know, both my parents, um, well, they, they could have lived longer, but shit happens. My grandparents lived very long and, um, uh, you know, I stay active. I eat right. You know, we were talking about the vegan thing before. Yeah. Tell us um, about, tell us about any of that. I mean, go into detail if you want. Well, my, my son went vegan uh, maybe eight years ago. 
Um, and then my daughter did shortly thereafter. And when, when that happened, I figured, okay, we'll, we'll cook vegan at home. It'll just make things easier. And honestly, I like eating vegan. And then, um, at one point we were out to dinner and I was going to order a steak and my daughter said, come on, dad, you know, it's right. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, I know it's right. And you know, it's a lot of reasons. I mean, there's the health thing, although you know, I'm pretty sure the human body is designed to take just about whatever it can get because we live in such varying climates and and uh, eco zones. True, um, but it's whatever we give it regularly that has the most effect, I think. Yeah, but but and you know, for me, a big part of it is the environmental thing because you know all the methane and all the the destruction of the seas. You know, and I, I've watched the. I've watched the documentaries. I've, you know, I've seen cowspiracy, seaspiracy. I've also seen the rebuttals. Um, but, you know, it's just not good. At, you know, at this point, yeah, 200 years ago, if you lived in Sweden, you had, a, you had to keep cows and you had to kill reindeer and that's what you had to do to survive. But now with the technology we have, we don't have to do that anymore. Mm. And we certainly don't have to factory farm and we certainly don't have to factory fish and, you know, where you're wasting 95% of the catch. I think it's called bycatch. Um, you know, it's not a political issue for me. It's just sort of a common sense thing that, you know, anything we can do to, to, to keep fucking up this planet that we've got and it's the only one we've got for now, you know, we might as well do it. Well, um, you know, we probably have mixed feelings about the the choices of food that we eat. Um, I know for myself, I've been eating vegan for a year, but, you know, I started this podcast seven years ago, so I'm sure I've got episodes about me talking about going and getting fried chicken, you know? So one of the big factors for me was just, you know, I, I selfishly like to start with what's good for me and what's what's healthy. Um, and again, looking at your photo, you look really healthy. You look like you're going to be doing this for a long time. And even listening to your singing on this recent record, I mean, you sound like you're rocking the fuck out, to be honest. Yeah. So um, any other stuff about just, you know, health choices for you and things that you maybe decided to change in your lifestyle along the way? Yeah, uh, I didn't drink for seven years at one point. Okay. Which which was definitely a good thing because I had put on a lot of weight and I just gotten kind of sloppy. Um, and um, actually, I, I then I, I stopped the not drinking for a while. And now I'm kind of heading back there again because I just feel, I, you know, at some point you realize that you've never, none of the good decisions you've ever made, none of the bad decisions you ever made were made sober. Well, actually, that's not true, either, but I never made, I never made, I cannot attribute any of my good decisions to the fact that I was drinking. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, so I'm working on that, you know, I'm, it's, uh, um, and, um, yeah, and I, and I work out, you know, I, I have a, a strength training regimen that I, that I do that kills me for, you know, every, I do it every five days and it takes me three days to recover because it's that hard. So it's a sort of like once every five days get really yeah. intense with it? Yeah, it all comes, there's a book called Body by Science. Okay. Which, and it's sort of, you know, related to the to the whole high intensity one set um, per, per body part workout that Arthur Jones, the, the guy who invented uh, Nautilus. And now, you know, it's, it's many generations of, of, of machines since then. But uh, there, there's, there's one line called X-Force that happened to be invented by a guy in, in Stockholm. And, uh, they it's funny because the, the gym I work out here has it, and then they have one in, in Stockholm. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I again, part luck and part determination and part denial of the fact that I am as old as I am. Well, I mean, it's really encouraging for me. I think it's encouraging for our audience. I'm discovering that, uh, you know, I'm, I happily find that we have a wonderful cross section of people in different age groups uh, who are fans of this show, but it also makes sense to me that there are probably plenty of listeners that are, you know, near same age, age range as me, um, and therefore we're all kind of interested in similar stuff. But but my, you know, take is that, because um, I'm 54 now, and I was just meeting with, um, you know, one of the rock stars 
who is 52 and, you know, another who's a little late 40s. And it's like, you know, we're all kind of in that territory of like, soon we get to focus on the music again. We get to like stop right. working five days a week or whatever, um, hopefully. And, um, you know, what does that look like? And and I think it's exciting. So anyway, again, to see you making music and living well and, and rocking out is encouraging. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm so, I, I call it lucky. Some would call it blessed, what fortunate to, you know, to be able to do this. Um, and uh, another factor may be that all of the people I collaborate with outside of my band, who are my contemporaries are, you know, 20 to 40 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's not like I seek out, you know, young people to keep me young, but, but, you know, it just sort of, they appear. Um, there's a young woman in, in Philadelphia who I've been working with for eight years and uh, she just turned 30. And we are like, you know, there is no, there is no age difference between us. Yeah. You know, we, we have the same aesthetic. We, you know, we're, we're partners in this thing and, and it just feels amazing. And then, and then there's Martin in Slovenia, who's midway between us. I think he's 43 now. Uh, but he's got an old school aesthetic like I do. But at the same time, he's very familiar with, you know, he's got one foot in the modern thing. You know, I'll send him a track and then he'll send me back synths and like, you know, cool drum sound augmentations that I know how to do it, but I wouldn't generally choose to do it. But when he does it, it's awesome. Right. Yeah. Well, I remember being in my 20s and wanting to hang around with people that were, you know, decades older than me because I found inspiration through them. And I guess as we get older, we begin to realize, okay, it's the same thing. You just get to be on the other end of that equation. Yep. I mean, you know, we're, we're just all looking for a good story to tell and a good way to tell it. Yeah. Well, very cool. Um, so some of the thoughts that came to mind listening to this record, um, I was writing down Tom Petty. I was writing down Warren Zevon, uh, the Jayhawks even, um, and then I also wrote down Zappa and the Beatles because I remember you mentioned those in your bio as influences. Mm -hmm. um, are there, uh, is there more you want to say about this particular record and some of the influences for you? Well, okay, Heaven Ain't Gonna Save Us, um, which was, uh, I guess, the second single I released. Well, the first single I released when I knew there was going to be an album. Um, I, said, I, like I said, I wrote that the day after uh, Trump was elected. Right. And, and, you know, the whole point of that song, it, it was, it wasn't pointing fingers. It was just basically saying, Hey people, we got to get our shit together here. Uh, there's one line in the second verse that surprised me because all my lyrics surprised me because they just come out and it's like, wow, I was thinking that maybe I'm smart. Um, the one line, there ain't no right or wrong wing on a plane that's got to fly in a sky that's got room for all of us. Yeah. Okay. There ain't no right or wrong wing. I get it. And, okay, dig it. That's great. Yeah, and and it's funny because I actually released it right after uh, this this latest election. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like um, like the right time. Um, but uh, that one originally, I I wrote it to sort of an electronic track. It was just sort of an experiment, and um, and it lived like that for a while. And then at some point, I, I just thinking about the lyric, and I said, No, you know what? This should sound like revolution. Yeah. And really, it is kind of a direct knockoff uh, of, of Revolution. Uh, originally, it started with a really fuzzy guitar going. And um, I sent it to Martin, you know, to, to master. And he said, uh, and I'm going to imitate a Slovenian guy now. You must replace this this uh, fuzzy guitar with the mandola. The mandola is you. It's got your vibe more. You must do this. <laughs> Great. Nice. So it, so in a way, it's a combination of Revolution 1 and the Revolution single. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's very cool. And and um, I love the video, too, because you just, that, that lyric, what is it? Like, everybody's got so much to talk about. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, just... it, you know, listen, if, if I can bring people together rather than split them apart, I will. I mean, it's, you know, I, I have a lot of friends whose political views are very different from mine, but they are still my friends, and I do listen to them. Um, maybe more than they listen to me, but I do listen to them. That's awesome. Hey. 
So you just finished an awesome mix and sent it off to the band, but the singer texts you with lyric changes, the drummer emails you wanting a different fill, and the bass player DMs you on Instagram about a wrong note in the chorus. But which mix version are they talking about anyway? Don't you wish there was an easier way? Samply.app comes to the rescue as your ultimate mix assistant, streaming high quality mixes so your clients can easily listen and send notes from their mobile phone on the road or a computer back in the studio. All mix comments are time stamped directly onto the correct mix version with no confusion and everything is easy to find in one location. No more mixed up mix messages from the band. It's file sharing that was specifically built for music and it all works in your browser with no downloads required. Sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app and use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months when you're ready to upgrade. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with a set it and forget it simplicity that lets you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Eric Bazilian, joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Um, We're going to dive into more discussions of making great sounding records remotely from faraway places during difficult times. Eric, you ready to jam? Let's jam. So you were talking about Revolution. And Mm -hmm. uh, now that we're on the Beatles topic, there's another track that is on the record that is just awesome. You did a cover of Help with a little bit of a twist. Yeah, th- that was a total serendipitous thing. Um, I, I believe we discussed last time. In my, my writing process is generally I come up with a riff on something and I'll make a track around it and then I'll start singing and see what comes out. So nice. I had this this riff originally on the mandola, which was like... That's great, man. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I know. And then you double track that thing, man. It's just godlike. So, you know, I cut that. I had a, a drum beat that sounded good with it. Um, then I, that was the fir- actually the first track I used that Ellie sound in the, in the, the, uh, the low tuning on. And I found that I could, I wish I had a guitar tuned down here, but I found that I, I could play that. in a D position, which really, I, I, I've done that a lot with the Hooters, like day by day. That's like all that, 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 da, 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 Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you call that, but I immediately recognize it. It's like the, when you're playing chords, but you're, you're letting yourself do the passing tones, you know, you, you sort of construct a real powerful, um, melody, you know, to, yeah. to go underneath it. And then you've also got like the gah, 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 on top at the end there. Right. I right. just love playing like that. That's great. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm really, I think the sort of the, the forebear of that was John Lennon's naive genius, uh, I Feel Fine. Yeah. You know, he's just in one position moving his pinky around. And it's just like, I mean, I spent, I spent days trying to figure that out. Uh, and I thought it must be two guitars. And then they did it on Ed Sullivan. It's like, that's how he does it. <laughs> that's cool. When you, before YouTube. Yep, before YouTube. So so anyway, I had this track and then, okay, it's time to sing. And I started singing stuff and things were coming out, but nothing that was really going, oh, wow. And then I, I, I closed down in the basement. I closed up shop for the night and I started walking upstairs and I just started singing when I was younger, so much younger. 
oh my God, that works over, over <laughs> my, and, and then I thought, well, I wonder if the chorus is going to work. So I, I ran back downstairs, opened up the mic and it was like hand in glove, even the chorus, you know, I had to, um, I had to change one note in the chorus to make it work. Wow. Yeah. I think it was the end of the chorus, right? I mean, to appreciate your being round. Yeah. yeah. This is a yeah. great twist. So I was like, um, you know, I'm not going to write a better song than that to this. So I figured, and, you know, again, this was early pandemic time. So it just seemed like a really, like a really uh, apropos thing to do. So, um, and I had, pro I had programmed, well, programmed, I had, you know, pre-recorded drums that I had put together that worked pretty well, but I sent it to, uh, to Martin in Slovenia and Roman came over and just totally nailed it. Um, and actually I, I let Martin, Martin mix that one. Very cool. Um, have, have Paul or Ringo had a chance to hear it yet? <laughs> uh, only if they listen to the Beatle channel. Okay, on, cool. On, on Sirius XM. They, they, they have played that a few times. Oh, that's cool, man. Um, well, so Rockstars, I recommend you go check that out. And a reminder that in the show notes, we put together a Spotify playlist where you can just click through and just jam out to all these songs. I'll be jamming out to them in my new um, reference monitors on wheels. Yeah. Electrified reference monitors. Uh, it sounded great in the car. And it was really funny also to listen to your discography as as with anybody who may be, have been making records you know across some different decades mm -hmm. like the difference in the way stuff sounds when you go back to the Hooters era versus the way you know, these these songs that you were created from a basement in in uh Stockholm sound and the they the new stuff sounds great man it really made my stereo come to life in a really good way so well that's, done that's that's great you know cuz I'm I'm I, I probably underestimate my my abilities in, in that department, but um, you know, I just keep doing it till it sounds good to me. I mean, I, you know, some of these uh, mixes, like when Martin would get them, he would go, "Dude, that tambourine, you got to turn that tambourine down." And I'm like, I can barely hear it, huh. or the hi hat, you know, because yeah. So, what are some ways that you trust yourself when you're mixing, as far as? Do you, you just sort of go for the excitement of it and then just, you know, let the frequencies, you know, bring in some experts? Like I just brought an electrician to install something for me. You just bring in somebody to address that bit. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, I know some some people, when they mix, they'll start from scratch. They'll pull everything to zero and then, you know, start with the drums or with the vocal or whatever. I, I just like to trust the fact that the, the track sounds good where, where I have it, you know, I, I, the, the instrumental balance that I had when I sang, um, the vocal level that I picked when I did my rough, you know, and from there, it's really just tweaking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm always struck by how important a rough mix is. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've done records where, I mean, on the Joan Osborne, uh, album, for example, uh, one of the tracks, I think the one, uh, I think ladder, um, we used a, a cassette rough for the for final that. record for the final record. I mean, we kept trying and trying. I know Bill kept, you know, recalling it, trying to do it exactly like he had done, done the, uh, the cassette rough, but it just didn't have the vibe. I think this, there's a story about the stones doing that too. Like wild horses or one of those tracks where they had to go back to the cassette demo and build the song off that because they just couldn't get the right feel in the studio. Sure. Sure. I mean, that's, um, uh, I think uh, the Go Go's to Vacation, I think, was mastered from a cassette. Wow! Let's bring back cassettes. Oh wait, I yeah. think the kids already did that. <laughs> Let's. I got a better idea. Let's us old guys listen to what the kids are doing and pay attention to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, awesome. And then uh, when you do a cover like that, um, is it fair? Is it safe to call that um, what's what's known as a derivative work? Since you're changing some chord structures around the song? And if so, what do the rest of us need to know about creating something like that? Um, what are the, um, is it, do you just make your, make the music and put it up? Do you, are there some, um, obstacles or are there some particular things we have to, you know, check boxes we have to do if we're going to release something? I didn't change any of the lyric and, uh, aside from one note, I didn't change the melody. So I, I just registered it as a cover. Okay, cool. Take it. I, right. I mean, you know, back in the day, 
a song was melody and lyric. It didn't matter what chord changes you put to it. I mean, now, you know, if you make coffee while, while the singer's singing, you're a, you're a writer. <laughs> um, okay, so let me go and ask you about something else you'd mentioned, um, working with Alexis Cunningham, doing some collaborations. Um, what's that project? Well, I met Alexis in 2013, I think, late 2013, through a mutual acquaintance who sent me an email and he said, you know, there's this girl, she just moved to town from West Virginia. Uh, she's got the voice, she's blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'd had my heart broken by by those too many times. So it was the last thing I was looking for. But, you know, I clicked on the videos, I listened to the songs and I'm like, yep, there, there's definitely something here worth worth meeting. So she came over and on a personal level, we just clicked instantly. Uh, my wife, who was the greatest judge of character in the world, really liked her. And uh, we wrote a song and it was really good and really fun. And I loved her voice. You know, she has a voice that's unique yet familiar. And um, we wrote a song and then we wrote another one and it was better. And we wrote another song and that was better. And we did a whole body of work, which was originally kind of in this alt country world. I guess now you'd call it Americana. and. Um, you know, we did that. We were really excited about it. We did a tour together in Sweden, which was really fun. Wow. And then I started sending it to my my people, the few people I still know in the, the record business. And it was sort of what I was afraid of. You know, the country people said, uh, yeah, we love this, but we do country, the same country. And then the pop people were like, well, I don't know what box to put this in. Uh, and at that point, we both decided we didn't really want to do country anyway. Um, so let, let's let's do a rock band. So we did that for a while. And she said whole, and I said the pretenders. And we had a kind <laughs> Nice. And that was cool. But again, it was like, what's so special about this? Uh, and then I met Martin Stibanik in Slovenia. And, and by, by this time, we really had some great songs. So I, I sent him... Um, I did some really stripped down versions of them. I would just take her vocal and play a guitar and a, and a simple beat. And he sent me back some you know, planet shattering ideas. So uh, I, he came to Philadelphia and we spent a couple of weeks in my studio and we made, I think, a world class album. And then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I sent it to, you know, again, those people that I know. And they all said, yeah, this is some of the greatest work you've ever done. Let us know when you've got a million followers. <laughs> so how'd you get a million followers? Well, <laughs> I think we're at a thousand now. All right, um, that's a start. So, so we've been holding on to, to the record that we did. And, and it, it's, you know, I, I, I'm not a man of faith, but I do believe in this. And I, I believe that when the right opportunity comes, uh, we will release it and it will get the audience it deserves. In the meantime, um, just for the fun of it, we started recording some Beach Boys covers, some of which are radical reinventions of the original. Um, most of those we did while I was there and she was here. And at, at my request, she got herself a Gefell MT-71. Nice. And um, records her own vocals into Garage Band, which works fine. She sends me the raw audio and I do my thing to it. So we did these these five Beach Boys tracks, and it's called Don't Worry Baby, and it's by Alexis Cunningham. Um, that's a, that, is, that, is that actually a title of one of the Beach Boys songs, or that's just the lyric? No, it is. It, it is, is the title. title. Okay, yeah. It's, just, it's just such a great title for it, yeah. a song and for a record. And it's, it's, um, it's one of the few that is... Actually, no, that one is a, is a very radical reinvention. And um, I'm, I'm going to get personal here and I'm going to get a little weepy, but um, I hadn't been home in almost a year. Uh, mm -hmm. And then in January, my mom got sick, went into the hospital and uh, I, I, I came back and uh, got to be with her when, when she left this plane of existence. Mm. And um, as that was happening, Alexis was coming over and we recorded that song. And in the days after, I... I I, I I had that song on repeat, her vocal singing, don't worry, baby, <laughs> everything will be all right. I just, it's what I needed. Wow. Um, and you guys recorded it right after that happened with, with um, your mother or? At yeah. The, you know, okay. Actually, as, as it was happening, I, I think, yeah. uh, um, and uh, a couple of the tracks that we did, um, uh, Surfer Girl 
and uh, in my room. Those we did remotely. There's like 16 tracks of me doing everybody but the lead, and then she's 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 Brian. Well, that's awesome. Um, I you know we don't have to stay in too too uh, heavy of a moment, but I lost both my parents. Um, it's been a been a while, um, and I noticed that. For me, each time that happened, I had a, a like a huge creative like tsunami of just something about it really opened me up creatively both times. No, it's you know, listen, it's it's a game changer for us. Yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I'm incredibly fortunate to have had you know both of my parents well into my sixties. Yeah, amazing. I mean, I had I had three grandparents until I was forty five. When I lost my mother, it was right when I started podcasting. Wow, yeah, and, it's it's fun. It's funny. I mean, the, on on the on the, the the downside, you know, I had really gotten into that my under the hood series. I had done um, Johnny B, and mm-hmm. uh, what was the other one I did? Um, uh, I think I, oh, you zombies and. And I was going to do one of us. That was going to be my next one. And then after my mom passed, I just kind of, I kind of lost the juice to do it. Yeah. But it's coming back. I'm going to do it. Good deal. Good deal. We, we want to just hear more music from you for sure. OWC now brings you the MiniStack STX, the world's first Thunderbolt 4 certified storage and hub expander, perfectly sized to stack with the Mac Mini, and the ideal storage and connectivity companion for Thunderbolt or USB equipped computers and devices. With the SATA HDD SSD bay and NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD slot, you can expand your Mini's storage capacity to gigantic proportions. Three Thunderbolt USB C ports enable you to connect to millions of Thunderbolt, USB, and future USB 4 drives, displays, AV mixers, cameras, and tablets, as well as desktop accessories like a keyboard, card reader, or mouse. I'm using the Mini Stack STX paired with my Mac Mini M1 to house my dedicated audio SSD and sample libraries at my studio, and it works great. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Fifty years ago, William G. Dilley introduced the world to his revolutionary new dynamics processor, the Model 610 Complimeter. A truly unique device, the Model 610 was not only the fastest, cleanest, and quietest of its type, but was also capable of providing completely separate peak limiting and compression functions. Today, Spectre 1964 introduces the Model C610 Complimeter, described as the most versatile piece of audio gear you can buy. Great for adding control and power everything from vocals, guitars, and bass to mixing and even mastering, the C610 gives you the same massive sound that rocked legendary studios like Stax, Arden, AdVision, a and and Record Plant. I'm using the C610 on every record I make at the Toy Box studio, and you should too. You'll love it. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. Okay, so and then that that I think uh, of course we're recording this in advance, but I think um, the Alexis uh, Cunningham stuff we may be able to include that in the show notes as this comes out. Oh, great, great! And actually, when this comes out, there may be a lot more newsworthy stuff regarding her, but I can't talk okay. about that here. Okay, great, <laughs> cool. Um, now let's talk about another uh, song off your record, um, Sarah when she's sleeping. Oh, yeah. It's a really beautiful song. And I lo- I was really struck by, again, um, lyrically, the writing. I, I appreciate the way you take a moment like that, which is just a, you know, it's like a, it's just a, a human, a common human moment. It's just an appreciation of a moment and it becomes everything you need for a whole song. And before I butcher it in my description, <laughs> just go ahead and tell us about that and and talk about, you know, um, if 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 what I'm saying makes sense to you, just talk about that aspect of it all. Well, that was another one of those songs that I had no idea what was going to come out of my mouth. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it started with a mandola riff again, and this one's in, in E actually, but it was a. Uh, so, you know, I recorded, made a little track, you know, a little B session. That's great. And We're here in the mandola right now, right? That's yep. That's the mandola. And Love then it. again, I picked you know I picked up the Ellie sound guitar and pl- found that uh, playing that in 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 uh, E on the mandola on the guitar, I found this great birdsy riff. <laughs> Birds slash beetles. Yeah, um, that's great. And, you know, again, you know, put the headphones on, started sleep, started singing. <laughs> I love springtime when it's raining. That's cheesy. I love the summer when it's dry. That's cheesy, too. I love <laughs> Sarah when she's sleeping. Like, whoa. When she's loving me, I feel just fine. Now, you know, my wife's name is Sarah. Nice. Uh, as fortunately. Um and the, the, you know, the sleeping thing is like, I, I didn't really know where that came from. But then when I played it for her, she like laughed and said, oh, you wrote, you wrote that song about my snoring. <laughs> and, and she does, she has this adorable snore, which I find comforting. It actually helps me get to sleep. That's great. That's great. Um, but then another dimension that someone pointed out later was, um, uh, I think we talked about this in the last the last episode. Uh, I wrote one of us. I wrote, you know, the, the the melody and lyric while she was asleep on the living room sofa. Nice. She had fallen asleep, and then she woke up, fortunately, just in time to su- suggest you know, the last line of the chorus: "Trying to get home, trying to find, trying to make his way home." Yeah. When when I heard that bit, I just thought about, you know, the touring musician, and I, I pictured coming coming home from tour, coming home from gig, being on that alternate schedule and you get home yep. and, you know, um, whether it's, whether it's a wife in the song or whether it's, you know, seeing your kid, your daughter sleeping or something, something about like the home and the family being asleep and being, being the comfort. Yep. And, you know, I don't write a lot of love songs because I don't, I don't want to write one unless there's a, a unique pers- perspective. Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, this one I feel really good about. Yeah. So the question I'd written down was, you know, it's a great song about regular life and love. How do you, how do you like to bring life to the lyrics, you know, which maybe there's more you can say about that. I mean, sometimes I just want to take, uh, I've actually done this once where I just took a text message a friend sent me and I was like, that's the song. I'm going to write that. (laughs) But I mean, you know, like, do you, do you have a way that you are able to bring, you know, the normal, the normal things in life, um, and put them in the light and in, into lyrics so that it becomes, you can really appreciate the moment. I, I, that's what I try to do. That is my goal in all of my songwriting. But, but how do we do that? I mean, like, cause if we, I just made it sound all like flowery by even describing it that way. And if we sit down like, let's write about the moment, <laughs> then it's like, right, it right. seems like the writing session goes like, wah, 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 wah. No, if, and, and if you were to tell me write about the moment, I, I would write something either crappy or not about the moment. Right. But a day, an hour, a week later, I might write that song about the moment. Do you have a process yourself for capturing ideas when they come to you? I mean, like you were you were headed up the stairs when you sang Help and then went right back down to the studio. But what if you're out driving around or, um, you know, getting a coffee or whatever it is that you do? I used to have a Walkman. Now I've got an iPhone. Okay. So you just use the the memo app and just yep. sing or the, something? Or, or the notes app if it's, you know, if it's a title or, or a lyric. Yeah. And then what about your process of going back through that stuff so that it's not just lost forever? I probably should do it a lot more. Um, you yeah, and, you that, and me both. <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, although I, uh, back in the eighties was one thing that I, 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 was, I did go back and, and stumble on that cause I had done that a, a few weeks earlier, but you know, mostly it's, it's in the moment and stuff that happens, stuff that comes out is, 
it's always a surprise to me. And some, it's not always pleasant. I mean, I, I've written some songs that are kind of, you know, not real pleasant um, memories or experiences for me. And, and they needed to be written. And, um, and they've helped me a lot with processing stuff. And no one will ever hear them. Okay, all right. So it's so we're allowed to write songs that everybody else doesn't get to hear. Yeah, well, we have to. I mean, that's you know, it's like that um, that uh, artist way thing. You know, writing you know, the pages and just writing whatever comes out. And sometimes what comes out is not particularly pleasant. Yeah, but it's got to come out. It will come out one way or another. And then, do you have a usual method of going from sketch to something that might actually be heard on the on the final recording? Well, you know, again, usually I'm starting with a pretty well-recorded guitar, mandola, mandolin riff. And, you know, by the time I get around to singing, I've got something that sounds like a track. Okay. And do you find that that, um, you know, just brings out the right kind of energy out of your singing so that you end up liking it? Sure. Well, you know, I put the headphones on and it's kind of like I'm on stage, you know, with my yeah. in-ears and I just, you know, there's 10,000 people. What am I going to sing? What do I want to sing? How do I, you know, how am I going to reach them? What what are they going to want to hear? Nice. What I like I, gonna... I like that you picture yourself in front of 10,000 people. Yeah. And for you that's that's a normal place to picture yourself, you know, cuz you've been there. 10, well, yeah, I mean 10,000 is not an not an often occurrence these days, but you know, a couple thousand. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's great and I mean I think even in the studio when we're singing ourselves or we're helping somebody else sing on a record. Even just saying like, sing to the other people that are in the studio can be mm -hmm. helpful just because there's that, you know, it's it's not like a, you're not just singing into a vacuum. Right. I, I, I do well with an audience. I've done some surprisingly good vocals with, you know, people there and I'm not necessarily people I want to impress, but like, it's a performance. Yeah. Um. Okay, let's see. What else do I want to ask you? You're talking about singing in headphones. How often do you find that um, pitch is either easy or difficult when singing? And do you have any methods about using the headphones or not using the headphones that helps you with that? Generally, I find it easier to sing in headphones. Um, I, I love hearing the sound of my voice with compression. Yeah. And a little delay, you know, 287 milliseconds with a little stereo thing on it. Um, that, that helps me. Um, it's funny last night I was actually recording something here in the kitchen for whatever reason, I, you know, I got my studio out there, but, um, uh, and it, I, I was, it was all in a very low falsetto and <laughs> we won't go into why, but, um, I was, actually, I did have the finger in the ear for that, for that one. Right. So that means you got one headphone off and a finger in your ear probably. Yep. Yep. Um, do you, you know, and I guess in my experience, I find that it's can be it's really fun to sing with the headphones on because everything's just sort of exciting and it's easy to get into it. And then the moment I'm doing doubles or harmonies, I find it's helpful to start thinking about a, a one headphone off so that I can check my pitch. Hmm. Against that's it. funny. I I no, I I love hearing everybody. Well every me. Right. Uh, you know, when I'm singing, I mean, I, I do, I love doing backing vocals, you know, I'll, I'll record one up the middle, pan it over to the left, do the other one on the right. Yeah. That, that's a lot of fun. And, you know, and honestly, auto-tune and graphic mode has become my friend for that. Okay. So auto-tune versus some of the other, uh, you know, Melodyne or whatever you, oh, you found auto-tune to be really good. Well, you know, that's what I started with. And then when I discovered graphic mode, uh, um, uh, and audio suite. I just, you know, that's, I've tried Melodyne. It's just, there's a learning curve. So I, I do auto tune in graphic mode. Sure. And maybe they do the same thing. So yeah, you know, you don't have to learn every drum machine if you're just trying to program a drum beat. You know? Right. Exactly. Um, let me see. So uh, what did I want to ask you about? Oh yeah. In headphones. What about this? So I'm discovering this a little bit more. I'm discovering that my threshold for feeling the effects of tinnitus is getting lower and lower as I get older. And I don't, um, I don't really want to have a ringing in my ears or whatever. So I'm really trying to teach myself to work in the studio and really just turn the headphones down as low as I can get away with. Um, is that a thing that you also, you know, address and confront 
Or does your veganism and <laughs> once a week workout keep you superhuman in that department? Well, that ship sailed for me a long time ago. I've had tinnitus for probably 30 years. Okay. Probably, probably longer. I actually can pinpoint the moment when I had my first serious hearing damage when I was 16 in my basement at my parents' house and I was playing through my AC30 and trying to get a good tone without a pedal. And I, I just, I hit a high note and I just felt that little spike go through my left ear. And mm. I knew, and, and, you know, now I have constant, you know, both ears, sometimes it gets worse in one, uh, two different frequencies. Sometimes they'll get really close and they'll heterodyne and I'll get a third one up the middle. That's really fun. Nice. So you're, you've, you've always got a chord going. Yeah, is I've it the B been. chord? <laughs> maybe it is. I, man, maybe it is. I, it's too high for me to, to pinpoint. Um, you know, I, I had my hearing tested fairly recently because I was getting new molds made. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, she, the, uh, the, the audiologist said, yeah, you've lost um, 60 dB from 2K up. Wow. Wow. So I tried, you know, she said, here, try the appliance, try the, you know, the thing. And I, I kind of hated it. Um, everything, first of all, my own voice sounded like it was coming from the, uh, from the other side of the room. Maybe it was latency. Mm -hmm. She swore there's no latency. I went in my car and listened to music for you as a Tesla. For me, it's a Volvo. Okay. Um, of course it's, a that's Volvo. what that was mine before. And, um, I just didn't like the way it sounded. And I think I've, you know, the, the, I don't do mixes aside from the occasional tambourine that's out of the frame that are oppressively bright. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the brain makes up for a lot of that. And one thing I realized is the, the, the testing process for hearing, you know, they give you these little beeps, um, you know, at high frequencies. Now, the fact that I can't differentiate that beat from the tinnitus that I'm already hearing doesn't mean that I'm not hearing that frequency. It just means I can't hear the beep when it comes. Right. And I mean, you know, a beep is a beep. I mean, yeah. if we were making a record of beeps, that could be a real problem. But you know, I, I've mentioned this before when I interviewed David Blackmer many years ago of DBX and Earthworks. He was, uh, gosh, I guess he was in his 80s at that point or something. And he said that, you know, he also said he couldn't hear above a certain frequency. But he had, here was a guy who was designing microphones that would go up to 50K right. and speakers that would go very high as well. And he pointed out that he could absolutely still hear how all the the effect of all the frequencies without right, having to hear right. a certain cutoff. Right. No, exactly. And, and I, I do as well. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Now, now my son is very careful. That's you know, great. He won't, he won't go to a concert without plugs. You know, but, but, you know, I, I watch him working. The speakers are like barely audible. He keeps the headphones really low. And for me, I need loud. So I let me ask need, you this. Let me ask yep. you this. Cause I think, all of us parents probably would love to see our kids be more careful than we were. Um, is there anything you feel like you participated in to help him have that attitude or does, did he just sort of arrive at that on his own? Yeah, that's him. I mean, he's really, he's really into his health and into his diet and his exercise. And, um, and um, I think that's just who he is. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. I'm going to pivot to talking about your great, Guitar work. Uh, ah, your my record, favorite thing. Yeah, your record has some, uh, uh, and again, I'm referring to Bazillion now. I mean, there's a there's a bunch of previous records in the playlist, Rockstar, so please go check those out too. But I spent a lot of time listening to the most recent one. And um, just beautiful guitar solos, really awesome stuff that makes Thanks. me want to pick up the guitar and learn how to play. Uh, but also great slide work, I thought. Um so talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the importance of a well-crafted solo for you um, and playing slide guitar. Well, the slide thing, I can trace that back to seeing Pink Floyd live in 1970. And uh, David Gilmore didn't use a finger slide. He had, he had a steel bar, which he would hold... Um, come from under the neck and play with that. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So I went out and I got, I got a, you know, a steel, like from a steel guitar, I started playing overhand. And, uh, I, the first recorded, um, the first recorded version of that on, on a regular guitar is all you zombies probably, because there's that, that melody that plays in the intros, which mm -hmm. is, 
you know, overhand slide on a Les Paul Jr. with a fuzz tone and, and, a, and a bunch of delay. And that's the sound that uh, comes back a lot in Hooters records. Um, and, and now, does uh, that not, guitar have high action if you're playing lap style? Actually, no. I'm, and I have to be careful. Because right, you're uh, so, going to just hit the frets. When yeah. You're now, now, my, my gold top, it's challenging because the, the, the action, I have a 56 gold top, which is kind of the only guitar that matters at okay. the end of the day for, for me. That's the guitar I played one of us on. Okay. Um, and that one, the action's really low. But even on that one, if I'm careful, I can play slide and it gets kind of a cool character. But um, my other guitars, the action is more sort of in the human range. Um, and then um, on, uh, on this album, I guess back in the 80s has that, that slide solo and high has a slide. And the action on that Ellie is fairly high, so it wasn't really much of an issue. Um, and as far as the other guitar playing, there's not a lot of real shredding on that album. I think there are only two real, like, I'm soloing moments. One is on uh, Heaven Ain't Gonna Save Us, which I recorded here uh, back in 2016 on my gold top. And then Bleed Red, the last song on the album, which has got a pretty impressive bit of shredding. Yeah, I think that's the one I'm thinking of. I, I apologize. I, in my head, I knew that I heard one that really stood out as like a very impressive solo with some fancy, fancy finger work. Um, but I just didn't write down the title on that one. And that was, um, yeah, that was the gold top also through Mike Kemper. Um, um, that was another thing about being in, in, uh, in Stockholm. Uh, Mike Kemper lives here. So in Stockholm, I, um, I've discovered that the, uh, the Marshall 2203 plugin with the, on the, uh, Apollo is pretty awesome. Okay. So I basically made one rhythm preset for the, for the Ellie guitar and one lead preset. And I limited myself to those two, two sounds for the whole, for the whole record. What was the intention of limiting yourself like that? Well, all the records that I grew up with and loved, you know, the, you know, Beatles records, they're, you know, they had one guitar and one amp, basically. Yeah. And, you know, turn up for the solo or later on, you know, add a fuzz or some kind of distortion for the solo. So I, I like having, you know, having a visual representation of, uh, of, of musicians in a record. I want to be able to see the guitar player. I want to be able to see him step on the pedal for the solo. Yeah. Yeah. The API Select T12 is a two-channel, all-tube, Class A microphone preamp designed with API's proprietary AP2516 transformer on the input stage and a custom API transformer on the output stage. Built with the 12 AT7WC and 12 BH7 dual tryout vacuum tubes, the T12 represents a new and exciting variation on API's classic preamp technology and provides you with unique tonal options for your studio handling a wide range of recording applications, including stereo operation. Carefully engineered to provide classic tube performance and sound, the T12 brings you API's famous warmth, punch, and clarity in a new design, including a five-year warranty. Check out the new T12 Tube Mic Pre and T25 Tube Compressor at apiaudio.com. The first rule of mixing is make good mix choices. To do that, you need to be able to hear your music clearly and accurately. Can you imagine trying to paint a masterpiece while wearing rose-colored glasses or choosing spices for a new recipe with no sense of taste or smell? You would blindly guess with every brush stroke or think that your cooking is amazing when actually it's terrible. That's how it feels to mix when the frequency response of your room is impacting the sound of your music. Even after you carefully position your speakers and sound treat your room, you're probably not getting an accurate sound at your mix position. The frequencies in your room can have huge peaks and valleys that are completely screwing up your perspective. This is where Sonarworks Sound ID Reference can help you with the affordable solution for calibrating EQ and balance of your speakers and headphones to give you an accurate flat frequency response. By helping you to hear your music clearly, you can now start to get your mixes right. Get a 21-day free trial at sonarworks.com. Now, do you actually step on a pedal in the studio or do you come back no. and do that as an overdub? Yeah, I'll do that as an overdub. Yeah. 
Uh, if you, and even, I find the stepping on the pedal thing doesn't always work in the studio. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done it, you know, actually that on one of us, that's what I did on that solo. I, I had a rat and just stepped on it, which was totally spontaneous because I was going to overdub the solo. Nice. But the the live solo is the one that made it through. Yep. The, the moment was just like, okay, you're soloing now, buddy. The moment is so damn good. It, you know, when it's good, it's the best. <laughs> yeah, when it's not, but, you can do it again. But, uh, you know, I, I love guitar plugins. I mean, I, you know, I, I got Amp Farm when it first came out and I was like, wow, this is pretty good. I, th- I think most of the solos on the Optimist are actually Amp Farm. I just gotten it. And then 11, I think, took it to another level. And then there's Guitar Rig, which I don't know how realistic it is, but, you know, I just like going through the presets and like, wow, I like this. Yeah. Have you tried the Helix one from Line 6? Yeah, I actually, I have the Helix um, Stomp, the, the little one. And in Sweden, that's that's what I use for live gigs. I just have, t- you know, basically two sounds, a rhythm sound and a lead sound. Plug that into the PA and into the monitors and everybody's like, wow, how'd you get that? Nice, man. Um, I, yeah, I have a the plug-in version and have messed around with it. And I love all the variety of sounds you can get. It's just fun. Yeah. I mean, I like to pretty much stick to one sound, to, you know, to me, it's kind of my voice really... My guitar playing is more my voice than the thing that comes out of my throat. Never right. considered, I never considered myself a singer, and um, you know, I do it by default. I enjoy doing it, and people seem to like it, so I'll keep doing it. Well, if you're not a singer, then we're the rest of us <laughs> are in trouble. So, because <laughs> your singing but, sounds great. But the thing that I the thing that I love about the Kemper is the fact that I'm playing my own profiles. Right. So that's so like, how that works. You can you can actually create something that mimics a physical amp. It, it's indistinguishable. I mean, when you when you do a profile, you can A, B between them and you get it to the point where you really can't tell the difference. Okay. Um, and then I don't know if we need to get too deep into the Kemper land, but it, when you do the profile, you're profiling the head of the guitar and then you're running using the same speaker. Is that how it works? Um, you can do it that way now. When When I did my profiles, you just had to profile the whole signal chain and somehow it knows and it separates what it thinks is the cabinet part from the amp part. Okay. So like, so like, you know, I profiled my Plexi Marshall and my, and the AC 30 that I made all those records with. And then in the studio, you want it to be profiling the speaker too. Cause you cause you're just going to play guitar direct in the studio. Yeah, and even live, I I just take the direct out from the from the uh, the Kemper. Okay, so I guess I, it's just like a profile of the whole speaker chain. Yeah, and the mic, you know, because yeah. I and and you know, live, the the Kemper does have a power amp in it, but you can set that so it bypasses the speaker part of the profiling, mm-hmm. and 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 you know, the 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 cabinet on stage is just for stage fill. Right, right, and then um, which mic would you have used when you profiled your amp, the Gefell or the fifty seven? Uh, it was the Gefell. Um, you know, Bill Whitman is is like is has a zero tolerance for for uh, for uh, SM fifty sevens. Okay, and and I've you know so long worshipped at the temple of Bill that uh, you know uh, I've used fifty sevens and they sound great. You know, Dave Thoner rec- recorded our second album with fifty sevens on oh, guitar wow. and they sound they sound great. Um, but uh, I still have Bill whispering in my ear. It's a shitty mic, shitty mic. And and we did use a, a 47 for my guitars on on Nervous Night and uh, and uh, the Gefell uh, MT71 on the Joan album. So that's what I profile with. Nice. And when you say the second record, that was the second Hooters record? Yeah, that was uh, one, one Way Home. Okay, groovy. Yeah, David Thoner's been on the show, Rockstars. You can check out that episode. Um, I think we split it into two episodes, too. Um, those, those were great. He talked about recording uh, For Those About to Rock. We salute yeah. you. Uh, he he was he was amazing to work with. And it's funny because um, when we 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 did uh, one way home with him instead of Bill because Bill was busy uh, I think doing the outfield at that point or doing their second right album. yeah and he had some great stories to tell about making that record too and, and I heard them I listened to his uh, his podcast I but, think about um, that now when I think about uh, recording and not trying to rely on the um, well, two two things. If you don't mind me remembering what Bill said, sure. two things I remember take away from that. One was 
take a part that you've got and see what happens if you break it up into a couple of different guitar parts right. instead of playing right. it all at once. Right. And two um, was, was um, you know, don't, don't fix it a little bit later. Just keep recording it over and over until you just nail it right now and see what happens. Yep, yep. Or in my case, you know, play it, make a bunch of mistakes and learn to love them. Yeah, that, I do a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, but uh, Dave was one of the few engineers that Bill okayed for us to work with. And oh, it's cool. Funny cause, and it's funny because Dave, you know, Dave's workflow is different from Bill's. Dave does use SM57 and probably does not rely as heavily on the, uh, did not rely as heavily on the compacts for, on the mix bus as built it. Maybe it did. I don't, I wasn't really paying attention back then, mm -hmm. but, um, and, you know, there are a lot of different ways to get there and Bill will be the first one to admit it. Nice. Um, all right. Well, let me go back to asking a question, re-asking a question that I started asking before about how music and puzzles go together for you. Mm -hmm. um, and the the rest of the question is, what can we learn from Bach and Mozart for rock and roll and power pop? Uh, so I guess you know that I've been torturing myself for the past four and a half years learning the Bach violin sonatas on the mandolin. I saw a little bit of that. That's in the YouTube channel. It's great. Uh, yeah. Um, it's It all started when a friend of mine showed me a video of Chris Thiele playing the G minor uh, violin sonata, and I just thought, how hard can it be? Well, it turned nice. out Chris Thiele, Chris Thiele, who was like, you know, the Joe Bonamassa of the mandolin, has been working on those for 20 years. He's very, very good. He is really, really good. So um, it's funny, you know, that's sort of been a bifurcation for me. I don't know that I've really felt the effects of studying Bach on my my songwriting yet. Although I think it has opened up my harmonic horizons a bit. Now I don't know how relevant those are to to um, to rock and roll. But on the other hand, I've always sort of written that way. You know, I, yeah. I always like to have these cool, you know, chord movements, uh, internal stuff going on. Um, I just do it because I love it and I hate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine as you learn these songs. You know, to to ask the question that I just asked and think about it, we might expect some, you know, sciencey answer like, oh, I, I think about all the harmonic stuff differently, as opposed to the practical answer, which is you learn how to finger all these um, parts on the instrument. And then next time you're composing or writing, you realize, oh, wait, my fingers can go here. What is, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, that actually works in my songwriting. But it's funny though, because since I've, dedicated myself to this practice of, of, of Bach, I'm using the mandolin much less in, in my songwriting, in, in, in the rock and roll thing. In a way, it's like I, 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 I reserve the mandolin now for, for Bach. Right. In fact, I, I put flat wound strings on all my mandolins because it sounds better for Bach. I thought maybe you were going to say you're just using ink and parchment now for all your writing. <laughs> yeah, By candlelight. I did get a fountain pen. Well done. I got one this summer too. I got it for sketching, but then I discovered that that's not all you need. You actually need to get the right paper or else it doesn't really work. Yeah, there, there's that. And you have to use it or else the nib will clog up and I've had big problems with that. Oh man, it's like it's like renting a paint sprayer to paint your house and then you don't clean it. Right, right. And the next day it's ruined. Um Awesome. Well, so any other stuff? Like, let's say we were going to learn, we were going to say, hey, I want to learn my first Bach piece. What would you suggest to somebody? Well, it depends on what instrument they're going to be playing it on. Um, so, so here's a good story for you. I was 11 or 12 years old, and there was a record out by a guy named Sandy Bull mm -hmm. called Inventions 2. And he was a very innovative guy. Um, uh, he played... Acoustic guitar, electric guitar, oud, and stylistically, it was it was all over the place. He did what he did a version of um of uh, the theme from from uh, Orpheus, you know that. I love or, or all those he, those parallel the bass harmonies that you do, and that he, that goes right back to the John Osborne track. Well, that you guys did. I kind of play like a classical guitar player. I mean, I, I use my fingers and, and a flat pick like all the time. Yeah. 
Um, but uh, so he he, rec- play, he recorded that on an oud. And one of the pieces on the album was he did two versions of a Bach um, classical guitar interpretation of a uh, cello gavotte. Uh, one he played on a nylon string guitar and one he played on an electric guitar. And I decided one day to feign illness and stay home and learn it from the record. Um, I never really learned how to read music. Uh, I've, I've gotten better at it learning the Bach because you just cannot pick that shit up from a record. Yeah, and any plan that begins by using the word feign is already a good plan. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I stayed home from school that day, and um, by the end of the day, I could do this. So forth. You learned that one in a day, in a day by ear. Wow, that was a that was a, a milestone for for me. That <laughs> and that and uh, oh yeah, uh, but um, but I think that informed my guitar playing uh, in a very significant way because you know everything I wrote tends to have you know finger pickery things, moving basses, internal voices going, and it, it's not something I think about. It's just sort of the way I, the way I roll. You know, um, thinking about, you know, playing and as, as we get older, you know, what do we, where does our musical direction take us to? It just reminded me of, um, when I was first playing guitar at 18, my mom wanted to inspire me and she took me to go see Andre Segovia at the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And he was in his eighties and he played for hours. He did like five encores or something. And I was, it was, I was young enough or I was uh, old enough to be, to, for, to make an impression on me, but I was also young enough to not fully appreciate it all the way yet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But amazing stuff. And, and, uh, I'd like to be playing for a long time. I've been spending a lot of time listening to Django Reinhardt and Stefan Gopelli oh. and I uh, just love, love that stuff too. That's, that's like a whole, whole nother world. A good friend of mine is, is way deep into that. Yeah. And I actually had the opportunity to record Stefan Rembel, who is sort of the, the, the living, the living heir to, to that, to that uh, tradition. Uh, he's a French, French gypsy, I think, but he, mm-hmm. he lives in New York, but he's come to my studio a couple of times and watching him is just, <laughs> the, the, we did two tracks the first night and he, I did take after take like 12 takes of the first track before he said, okay. And I kept saying, no, man, I can comp it. No, no, no. I got to get it right. Second track, one take, boom. Nice. But, but that, you know, that's just, that's another language that I, you know, I just don't know if I have the juice to learn. Jazz is another thing too. It's like, you know, I saw George Benson when I was 21, 22, and I sat in the front row at a little club. And it was right before he crossed over into pop stardom. It was right when this masquerade was coming out. And for the first half hour, I was, I was depressed thinking, you know, I, I will never be able to play like that. And then suddenly something flipped in my head and I went, you know what? It is possible for a human being to play like that. Nice. I may not play, I may not play that like that, but I will play something like that. Well, speaking of playing, um, another note I made was that I just felt like you were playful with your melodies, like um, wherever you go, you take you with you. Oh, yeah. It's really, I like the way you just, you kind of take a melody and you keep meandering, you know? That's another one. That one wrote itself. I wrote that in actually in 2013, now that I think about it and, and recorded it. Um, I was waiting for James Bourne to come visit me for the first time. We had met in LA and he had moved to New York and he was taking the train down. And I literally picked up the guitar and, you know, again, it was was a very Eric riff that. And just started singing and, um, 
And uh, I, I, I literally wrote the song while he was on the train from Center City, Philadelphia, out, out here. And uh, he came in, I played it for him, and he sang it. And I have a great recording of him singing it. And I actually think it's better than mine, but for my record, I had to sing it. That's great, man. This episode is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, the soundtrack to this podcast, in fact, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. These techniques would work for you no matter what DAW you're using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to practice your mixing and even include in your mix portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Well, let's see. Let me ask you also about your vocal chain. I think we know what the answer is. But um, when you are recording your vocals, uh, what is it that you like to sing into and and how do you set it up to get a great, you know, particularly on this this most recent record where you probably had limited stuff? Yeah, well, my, my, my real vocal chain here is um, a Gefell uh, UM92, um, which I got right after we made the Joan record. Because, you know, at the time, Gefell, you could get a, a Gefell mic for half half of what the corresponding Neumann would be. And it really was a Neumann because Gefell was the East German Neumann factory mm-hmm. until, the wall, until the wall went up. Um, and so mine is one serial number away from the one we recorded uh, Joan with. Okay. Um, all right, cool. And um, I, I, I love that mic. And uh, so that into um, uh, a Day King, uh, J- uh, Jeff Day right, King. Right, we talked a lot about that. In fact, Jeff was on the podcast not too long ago. Oh, I, I need to hear that. I need to call him too. Um, so I, yeah, I go into a Day King and um, usually flat. Sometimes I'll add a little, a little 10K with an API 560B, um, roll off a little bottom, you know, blah, 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 what you do. And then um, uh, API 525. Okay. Um, and then um, is that what you did for Bazillion when you were recording in uh, Stockholm, or did you have to do something else? Well, I didn't have any of that stuff there. So I did have one of my uh, my uh, MT-71s, which is the same capsule and basically the same mic. It's like using a U-47 FET as opposed to a Tube 47, and which, by the way, all the Hooters records were U-47 FET. On okay. the vocals. All right. We, we would do the shootout every time and the Fed always won, at least for our 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 voices. Um, I, I think that's what I heard um for Metallica as well. Yeah, it's a that's a great mic. We still have one. I think Rob has it now. I have the compacts, he's got the, the mic. Um but in uh in Stockholm, since all I had was the um the uh the Apollo, I would go into the um ten seventy three unison mic pre. Um pretty flat. Usually, again, you know, add a little 10K, a little high pass. Um, and there, there is no, there is no uh, uh, UAD 525 plugin. But I also know that, that when I mix, I usually run, a, run vocals through some uh, Fairchild plugin just because it's a Fairchild. So um, my... My recording chain there is the 1073 into the Fairchild plugin, which I try not to hit too hard. And then the Studer, because it's a Studer, and I guess it sounds like tape. I don't know. Right. Uh, people that I trust say it sounds great. Um, but then my my secret sauce in the box is there's a company called uh, LSR Audio. And I think they're in France. And they make the only 525 plugin. Cool. And the, the only, 525, that's the API compressor. Right, right. right. Now, you know, uh, UAD does have the 2500 and, and the vision strip, but those compressors don't do what the 525 does. When you put that 525 on in DS mode, it doesn't DS, it just 
does something to it, Mm -hmm. which is awesome. And the plugin sounds great. So, you know, before or after the fair shot, I don't know, but that's, that's what I do. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, well, dude, I think we're coming to the end of our time here. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about yet that we need to, uh, that I need to ask you? I'm sure I'll think of something later. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, um, I just want to say thank you again so much, Eric, for joining us on the podcast. It's been a super blast to hang out with you. I will ask you this question, which I did ask before, but mm-hmm. I'd like to close out the podcast. We're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine and you get to go back in time and find yourself. I don't know how far you want to go back, but you can decide. Um, but you're going to give yourself one bit of advice and say, listen, dude, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Um, put that in whatever context you want. But what advice would you like to go back and give yourself, whether it's going way back or whether it's going back before you know your most recent record? Any of those things. And we're, we're talking studio related here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, life is I, studio. Studio is life, isn't it? I think last time I, I said uh, I, I would have told my 30 year ago self to smile. Okay. All right. Because I look at those pictures and it's like, I had everything in the world to be happy about. Why do I look like I'm pissed off? But that's what, we were, that's what the photographers told us to do in the you 80s. Know, and that's what my ex-wife told me. In to the do. 90s. It's not cool to smile, but you know what? It is cool to smile. It's really cool to smile. There's nothing cooler than smiling. Uh, but the the other bit of wisdom I would give that self is to listen to your own voice. Um, nice. Listen to it. Pay attention to it. Listen to other people. Take their opinions. But at the end of the day, you got to make the decision uh, what feels good, what sounds good, what is good. Yeah. You know, one writing one of us was an epiphanal moment for me because it was the first time that I really let myself just, you know, let that stream of consciousness go and, and, you know, follow it to the end. And we see how that worked out for me. Yeah. It's almost like, um, when you learn to listen to your own voice, then you are more inclined to do something bold. And if everybody, if it really connects with everybody, then it it's hugely meaningful and really works. And if it doesn't connect with anybody, then who cares? Because nobody ever heard about it. Yep. yep. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it's funny because I mean, related to this record, um, I I wanted Martin in Slovenia to to mix the whole thing because he his, his the mix he did of Help was just amazing. Yeah. And he said to me, "No, you have to mix this yourself. This is your record. You know how to do this. You know how to do this. This should sound like you." Um, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you my, my feedback on it, but, but you do it. Well, I think you did a great job. And and actually I remembered the question that I wanted to ask you, you kind of hinted at it, but one of the things that struck me was your vocal treatment, the effects on your vocals. It just like the excitement level in, in this record and the way you mixed it, just, I was high five and, you know, Oh, man. the air. And, and, um, you know, there was a, what did you do for some of your, your delays and effects on your vocals that you really liked? I, I'm pretty bare bones with that. I mean, effects, you know, aside from the compression going in, um, I pretty much just use an echo boy, set it around 287. Um, I use very little reverb. I'm not a big fan of reverb in general. Um, yeah, you know, it was the, put, the, the echo, the, the kind yeah. of delays really made it. Yeah, you know, it's funny cause it's, it's kind of like that, the delay that Bill used on, um, on, uh, on the outfield. Jody's on a vacation far away. Nice. Um, so yeah. And you know, and listening to it now, I might've could, might've could have been a little more judicious with it, but you no, know, what? hell it's, no, dude. It's, it's exciting. You know, I wouldn't it, be here it, asking if it was too ju- you know, judicious, I, <laughs> you know, and I know a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll like to put a little stereo field around a lead vocal, but man, I, I, you know, I think about those petty records, you know, when he started working with Jeff Lynn and that vocal is just dry and loud and up the middle. Yeah. And they, that was said about Rick Rubin too. Um, Richard Dodd said Rick Rubin just wanted things bone dry, very little effects if ever. Yep. Yep. You know, sometimes I'll use a little room on backing vocals or something. But, um, um, what about, well, you said the Echo Boy. Now I do, I do know that, oh well, yeah, Echo Boy. Okay, cool. I'm, I was thinking about the um, Echo Farm. So Echo Boy 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Just I mean, that, you know, I, I have a preset that I like, um, you know, Echo Farm was revelatory when that came out. Yeah. I, I just, I just loved that. Um, but then, you know, it, it didn't work, uh, for, for HD for a while. Now there's a new one, but it's like, I'm getting the sound I want out of, uh, out of, uh, out of the echo play. I mean, I, my favorite delay ever is a, is a memory man mm -hmm. with a, a little bit of one. Yeah. With a little bit of chorus on it. And I still have mine, but, um, I think the, there's the, uh, the, uh, one of the, one of the, uh, avid delays, I think it's the BBX is basically a, a memory man. I use that sometimes, but I like a stereo spread yeah. on it. And somehow the, the echo boy does that really nice. So awesome. I'm a fan. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you for joining us on the podcast again. Please let the rock stars know where they should go check out all your amazing work. If they are ready to write and record their next hit record or just talk to you about how to how to do a great record, how would you like them to uh, find you online? Well, they can go to my website, my, my recently renovated website. I think last time we talked, my website was an embarrassment. Um, a friend of mine in Stockholm, who's very good at these things, did a nice website for me, very basic, but it has all the information, ericbazilian.com. No R, it's not Brazilian. Uh, Instagram, at Eric Bazilian. Twitter, at Eric Bazilian. Facebook, I have a personal Eric Bazilian. And then there's my my page, the Eric Bazilian music page. Nice. And if you, if you Google um, Wiki and Bazillion, you get a description of a very, very large number too, but it's not spelled like that, Rockstar. It's spelled yeah. differently. <laughs> yeah, um, it's funny. I used, to, I used to like joke with people. I'd say, um, you know, yeah, like a bazillion dollars. And they would look at me like, what? And now it's, and now it's like, oh, you mean like a bazillion dollars? I'm like, God, you're 40 years late with that one. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, man. Well, I, I'd like to think that your website went from uh, embarrassment to an embarrassment of riches. It's it's nice. You know, I don't, I, I actually should update it again as I should update my wiki page. Shouldn't we all? Yeah, really. All right, dude. Well, thank you, man. I look forward to seeing you in person. Um, thanks for making a great record. Thanks for great making a, a great record and doing a great job of addressing the things that have been on everybody's mind in the right kind of way. Oh, thank you, man. And thanks for doing a great podcast, man. I, I look forward to it every week. So. All right, groovy, man. All right, dude, we'll talk to you soon. All right, you take care now. Cheers. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rockstar i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. API, OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Sonarworks, and Isotope. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plugin purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of their plugins. And sign up for your free account with two projects now at sampley.app or use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months. And don't forget to use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in the description of the podcast. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to give a big thank you to our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks, guys. And thanks so much for listening, Rockstars. We'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.